History does come to full circle at times. About 10 years ago I reviewed a game called Iron and Oak and today we talk about Oak and Iron. However, with the exception of the title using the same words, this game is very different because this game is a miniature war game about naval battles in the age of piracy. And although it's a miniature game, uh, it's one that doesn't require to invest much on the hobby element of gaming, which is, as you may know from my videos, one that I'm not interested. I'm not interested in spending a lot of time, time uh, building models, painting models, but I don't mind if a game looks good without me having to do any of that, and this works, because this game does come with the core box, I'm going to show you six ships that are incredibly easy to build. I only had to use the glue once for one of them, and I didn't even glue my fingers together, so that's a, that's a win. So you're going to have uh, six ships, a mat as you see here, terrain tile to add interest to change the configuration of the play area. And of course it's going to be a lot of water, That's that makes sense because this is a naval battle. And so you're going to have again this mat here in thick coated paper. Very, very nice. So, yay! Now uh, painting. I mean, again, you could paint. No painting and no building required. At least that's, that's what matters. So, we're gonna fight. That's the idea. The game is between two uh, forces. So, naturally, you can see it as a two player game. You can also play it in teams. Uh, so, people sharing control. Uh, there are multi faction battles uh, that are the rules for those are described in the rule book. Also, you can play the game solitaire like I did. I played both factions at the best of my possibilities. And there are enough random elements here to make it perfectly possible possible and I enjoyed the game that way. So we're gonna have a marker that indicates the direction of the wind, all important of course because of our topic. We have our models that represent the position of the ships on the on the board. Here there is a slot where you can place a token indicating the nationality or the faction at least. And of course I'm playing with pirates because because it's why do I have to explain? Pirates are pirates. That, that's self-explanatory. Who would not want to play with a pirate if there is an option? So the miniature marks the position of the ship on the, on the board. Then you have a card that matches the ship that tells you the technical specifications. Each faction will also have an admiral and you place that on a specific... Oh, the light changes. Uh, that's so cool. Um, and you place that on a specific ship, uh, giving you different kinds of abilities. There's a rating here that also may be used for game effects. But in detail, more in detail, what we're mainly interested in here is this section here. These are the things that are upgrades, you don't need to worry about them right now. Here's the fortitude, think of them as armor points. The um, the, the cannon uh, strength, the number of dice that you roll when you are firing from your broadside. Crew, f crew uh, fire number or crew strength, which you use in other situations such as boarding party or when you are firing at low rate. These are movements, uh, different movement values based on the direction of the wind. So basically if the wind is hitting the ship in from behind anywhere in that section there and so that you can see the template at the bottom of the ships uh, of the ships matches that as you can see from a line that goes here and those lines there and a line here that cuts the ship in two. So we need to check when we move uh, the direction of the wind to see what the base movement is. Different things may change it. But basically if the stern here is closer to the wind, the direction of the wind, than the front of the ship, then you're going to use this speed here. If you are, if the wind is hitting this section here, then you use this reduce speed. And then if you're really just going eh, against the wind, well, you're not. You cannot move that way. You have to turn instead and go with the wind. That's uh, that's the idea. It's an age of sail. What do you expect? So 
Here we have indicators for fatigue and damage. As your crew gets stressed out, you take fatigue, which will immediately reduce your uh, capabilities by removing dice every time that you roll dice. And damage will, of course, reduce your effectiveness. When you get damage all the way to the bottom, then um, the ship is crippled. It only moves by two, no more. If it takes further damage, that is translates into fatigue, and again, there will be effects that will directly give you fatigue when a ship is both crippled and fatigue done. <laughs> the ship is effectively out of the game. And there are different rules, but uh, ultimately, to win the game, you want to inflict as much pain and destruction on the enemy forces as possible. This is a war game after all. Initiative cards are so important, each player will have a hand of initiative cards made out of cards from this pool here. Some cards are generic, as you can see, and some are specific to certain nationalities. So, you can there's a standard hand that you can start with, or players will create their own deck following rules <coughs> using cards from their nationality and or generic cards. And at the beginning of each turn, you will reveal an initiative card that you placed there the previous turn. So decisions have momentum here. So suppose that right now, one side is revealing this card and the other side is revealing this card. We look at the numbers, the higher number goes first. The play has initiative and also there will be game effects that are resolved at that turn. Usually cards uh, played for initiative will go back into your hand, but sometimes they don't. Another interesting thing, if you have the two initiative numbers are the same, then that triggers an event, and so you will, roll, will draw an event card and apply the effect, just to add a little more confusion and fog of war. Uh, to reveal the cards, uh, check initiative, check uh, for possible events, so we determine who has initiative, these cards are, um, for, for the moment, they go on the side, but the players, then they will commit to the initiative card for next turn, and then these go to their hands. So there is an interesting element there that you have to commit to your uh, initiative cards one turn ahead, and I like that very much. This is one of the reasons why I find the game to be uh, very friendly to the solitaire player, because I decide I want to do a thing next turn, and by the time it's time to flip that, Initially, card the situation has changed dramatically, and maybe now I have to deal with a problem instead of what looked like an opportunity. If you want to play solo and that's still a problem, then radical draw cards randomly. I played it that way too, and I had no problem. I build a hand of cards to start with, but then each turn I draw one randomly, and that's uh, that's a whole can of fun worms to deal with. That's why we play games because we want to have the the lovely trouble, the lovely uh, dilemma of making interesting decisions under difficult circumstances. So, for a turn, after we determine initiative, it's time to start moving. We're going to have a movement phase and then a combat phase. So, will players will alternate uh, activating their ships, uh, starting with the initiative player. When you activate a ship for movement, there are four steps, or up to four steps, as you say, that you take. First, you determine the speed based on, again, the position of the wind. What you see here is the base speed. There are modifiers such as you may go in a full sail, which means it, your speed is increased by one, or with minimal sails and your, your base speed is decreased by one, in case there's that token. But first thing that we do, token, no token, effects, the wind, we determine the speed of the ship. Then the player that is activating the ship can take a seamanship action. To do so, you roll a base number of five dice, and to be successful, oh, to be successful, you need to roll at least a sail and or a skull. Usually this is a very easy roll, almost always it works, but still it's nice because if you're counting on a seamanship action and you don't have, well, tough. Also, as you take fatigue, your pool is reduced, so although getting one of those two symbols out of five dice is very common, out of two, uh, or out of three, not as easy. The seamanship action will allow you to change heading, that means you can take a turn during this phase here, 
you may adjust the speed and that is when you may add or we may add or or move remove this token to change that you're going from standard to full or, or from standard to minimal minimal to standard this sort of thing there are also other you may cut free in case you're entangled but this is the main idea that probably your seamanship actions most cases will be to take a turn or to adjust your speed. The adjustment that you do during the, uh, actually I should have mentioned this, the adjustment you do during the uh, seamanship action is temporarily, so actually forget about the token, you don't change the token. It's only for the present turn. It represents like a minor adjustment, so it doesn't change your base ship. So during seamanship, adjust speed by one only for this turn, or take a turn. Uh, to move and to take turns, we're gonna use these templates here they look uh, very neat, so speeds are between 1 and 5. To take a turn, you place the arrow on a movement template next to the arrow that is, again, right in the middle of the side, of the broad side of a ship. And once you place it there, then, uh, well, you can turn around it up to uh, the point where it is now flush with the side of the of the arrow there. Uh, you can turn less, you don't have to take a full turn, but that's how turning works. And suppose that I decided not to turn, and I didn't turn. That's, that's deep. Now, calculate base movement, possible seamanship action, which is temporarily adjust speed or or whatchamacallit, or change heading, then yes, we move. Suppose that when all is said and done, our speed is three, then I take the corresponding template, place it again, arrow to arrow there, and move arrow to arrow there. When you do move, you can also take a turn, like I explained earlier, right at the beginning or right at the end of your movement. So basically, if you use a seamanship action, you can turn twice per turn. Some ships also have some other maneuverability thing there. After movement, you add the crew action, so you can choose to do one of... There's quite a list of actions, the most common are probably to reload. If you fired with a broadside previously, then you have that token and you cannot fire with that broadside again, unless at the end of movement you spend your crew action to remove that. You can spend a crew action to remove fatigue, to a point of fatigue, to remove a point of damage. You can uh, change the sail setting and that is when you actually use this token. Again, forget what I said earlier. What I said earlier in the symmetry phase is only a temporarily, temporary change. So, that's our movement. Uh, and I did movement with that one. And suppose now we're going to do movement with this one. This one has three. We decide to take a symmetry action. It's successful. The, and we use it to slow down only for this turn. So we move by two instead of three. And here we go. We decide not to turn or decide to turn. I don't know. I decide to turn just because it looks cool. There you go. Around that. And then I decide that, I don't know, not to take the crew action. So, now it's time to fire. After everybody completed their move, uh, players will attack each other. Uh, there are two main types of attack. There's also boarding, but is when you shoot at each other that is the most common. And there are two main ones. One is when you're firing with your full broadside, in which case, the positive situation is like this though, in which case, after you do so, again, you use this marker here, and to use the broadside fire, you need to have an enemy well in the projection of your broadside, I suppose, like that. And so, simple enough. And you have a ruler here that is used to check if you have line of sight to an enemy and also to check uh, the distance. And depending on the range, there will be different game effects that will allow, that will apply. Another way of firing uh, that is like a reduced fire, it does not add a, a token of that kind, so you can do it even before you're reloading it. You don't have to fire out of the broad side, so you can use any side of the ship. The point is that when you're firing with the broad side, you're using your, your cannon rating, 
and when you're firing with the uh, partial fire you're using this other rating here. The rating indicates the number of dice that you will roll in combat as modified by, yes, by fatigue. So, usually this is more powerful, but you need to reload and reload if you can reload every turn. Yes, but if you do that, uh, you're not recovering fatigue, you're not doing something else. In any case, to fire, you roll a die, I mean, you roll the dice, ooh, nice roll, and you look at the symbols. The distance will tell you which symbols count as hits. So this distance here, for example, the muskets, the pistols, the cannons, and the skulls count as hits. At the musket distance, then only the musket, the cannon, and the skulls are cannon distance only these two so very very simple very efficient because you have your player rate right there on the board right now for example at musket distance that is uh, for that that's five hits that's not good that is not good for this ship here we compare the result with the fortitude of our target and we inflict a hit each time that the number of hits goes over the fortitude of the ship. So, for example, if a ship has two, two hits will, imp will inflict one damage. Four hits will inflict two damages, and so on and so forth. Also, any hit, uh, any hit, even if it doesn't cause real damage, will cause fatigue. Just the fact that if there is a hit at all, fatigue applies. And then, if Skull showed up, then you also had to roll dice for each Skull to apply possible critical effects. So, this is the general idea. Uh, of course, that it's bare bone, it's uh, move and fire, but with more steps, with more options, with the wind telling you which directions matter, and with a lot of momentum, you're really constrained by the physics, by the momentum, by your decisions, by the maneuverability of your ships. So there's going to be a lot of maneuvering, but when you're in the right position and you're crossing the T of the opponent and you unload those massive broadside cannons, yes, that that's quite satisfying. So continue to play until uh, until the end of the scenario. Again, there are different possible scenarios, but trust me, destroying your opponent is always a good idea. It's always an effective way of getting closer to victory here. Oak and Iron is very good. It's a really good game. I really enjoyed it. And it is the kind of war game that I think we need more of because it's something that you can pick up easily. Uh, the entry point uh, is, not, is not difficult. It's not prohibitive in terms of complexity, how long it takes you to learn the game, in terms of setting it up. You set it up quickly, you place two ships on each side on, on the board and you're pretty much good to go. So I think we need more of these games that have lower logistics, so simple logistics to be able to introduce new players to the hobby because it's something that I think we all need to do if we want to uh, have historical war gaming still being part of the hobby in a couple of years. So this is something I can see playing with a younger war gamer uh, or an aspiring war gamer, and it is a legitimate war game. It has all that they need, all that they want from a war game. Uh, the core engine is pretty simple. Then you have a couple of extra cases that will require extra rules. So if you're boarding, if you're landing, things like that. But you don't need to worry about any of those to start playing the game, and I like that. You can just pick up those specific cases as you go. And even I re realized as I explained the game to you, I had to go through the steps, and just the core sounds a lot more fiddly maybe than it actually is. It is extremely uh, intuitive once you get the main idea and it flows very well and I think that's that's what you need. You really get a sense of these ships uh, and as, as, a, as a commander you have I believe the kind of dilemma that I want to have in a war game of this type which means I want to have a nice tension between the agency, I want to be able to do stuff meaningfully otherwise I don't need to play a game, I can watch a movie but at the same time, I want to be constrained, uh, not just by the actions of my opponent, but by physics. I want my decisions to have momentum. I want to be committed to certain things that I may regret later and then I need to try to fix them. But when I make those fixes, now I'm committed to those for a period of time. I think here they did a really good job in creating a nice balance 
in which, well, uh, I can exploit the wind, but only for a certain time. I can maneuver, but there are limitations to do so. Uh, selecting those cards, or if you're really brave or crazy like me, uh, play solo and draw them randomly. Crazy stuff will happen. And yes, maybe a game will become, you know, completely unbalanced because of that. But I'm just me. I'm just making decisions, trying to solve these puzzles, seeing the action. And sometimes those actions will be crazy and will be really spectacular and really cinematic all, almost. And so I really like the balance that you have here between having to maneuver within a context dominated by the wind where your decisions have momentum, when you cannot switch gears so easily. But at the same time, you still realize that you have a lot of interesting uh, decisions to make. It reminded me for this overall idea of Wings of War, which is a game that I like very much, and I'm not comparing it to reduce the, the individuality or personality of this one, rather to put it in a genealogy of games that I like very much, and that I believe really strike that the golden balance between complexity and simplicity, between agency and limitations. And so that's that's what I want to have, gameplay that the where my mental energy is, where it should be, on the gameplay, on the maneuvers, on, on the movement. And, and I really also like how the, your, the game becomes more challenging as you go because your ships become less powerful, because your crews are more fatigued. Those t tests, the skill tests at the beginning are very simple. You will pass most of them and then not so many. Uh, of course, because of the specific topic here, you are going to have moments which you feel the randomness kind of like ramps up. Um, because, yeah, failing a skill test early on is not a big deal. But when you're in the position to do, and you finally unload the broadside, that can be a swing there. So randomness is not evenly distributed, but overall, everybody will roll dice so many times that you do get the feeling that things will balance themselves out and extreme luck or extreme lack the rough <laughs> will ultimately hit everybody sooner or later just at different times so the game looks good it's easy to play it's very customizable again reminds me of wings of war where you can just or wings of glory uh, in which you can just start uh, very simple and then add more and more elements you have more elements more expansions that you can add to the core box if you want to see different ships and adding even more options but to me I'm, I'm really happy i'm really happy with the core box i'm really happy with the gameplay in general i think it's a successful war game and not just that it's not just one that is fun to play right now between you and i who already like war games is the kind of war game that we need if the hobby is to survive because it's the kind of war game that i see can be attractive to new players to younger players and that again that is the only thing that is going to keep the hobby going in a couple of years or a decade or two so high praise from me for oak and iron really fun war game and possibly the kind of war game that we need these days